Okay, so um, welcome to module nine. It's the last two. I feel like everyone's brains are probably filling up quite a lot now. I'm going to try and tell an interesting story about mobile genetic elements, why we love them, and how we try and identify them. And then in the tutorial, you'll try out a couple of different methods to predict and visualize mobile genetic elements before then taking them into a visualization environment, microreact, which I believe you've seen already this week, just to look at the compare to, to compare the distributions of different MGEs across a set of genomes. All right, so here we go. Um, yeah. So as I said, this module is about mobile genetic elements. And there's a few things that I hope to um, uh, sort of leave with you once we're done all of these uh, festivities. First thing is know the key types of mobile genetic elements that can mediate lateral gene transfer. Another is to understand how uh, lateral gene transfer, LGT, impacts the analysis of microbial genomes. And then, and this is where it's really interesting and fun to think about what sort of clues we use in bioinformatics. What, what do we grab onto to try and predict and classify mobile genetic elements? And then if we're using these tools, how do we contrast them? And then the last aspect of this presentation is despair, because this is a really hard problem. And as with so many things in biology and evolution and diversity, it's even difficult to describe what we're talking about, never mind how to detect it. And so those thoughts need to feed into the design of bioinformatics me methods and the in uh, interpretation of results. So hopefully not too despairing, but just a little bit of despair is good. So four parts, really three parts, plus a little asterisk at the end. One is we're gonna talk about the suspects, which is our various mobile genetic elements. Part two is the evidence. How do we know or why do we think you're a mobile genetic element? Part three is the case. What are we doing to investigate? And then part four, and Finn alluded to this towards the end of his uh, practical there, talking a little bit about the Oddity pipeline, which is a software pipeline that's been developed um, primarily in my lab, but with the participation of many people, including several others who are participating in this workshop, which is really meant to put together a seamless workflow from genomes to pan-genome inference to mobile genetic element prediction to phylogenomics and then to inference of lateral gene transfer. So I'm just going to say a couple things about that. Okay, here we go. Part one, mobile genetic elements and gene transfer. So what is gene transfer? I assume most of you have heard of it. Um, I call it LGT, but it's often referred to as horizontal gene transfer. It's the same thing. And we can think of evolution happening on a species tree, right? So we have the root of the tree, and then we have descent with modifications and speciation. And if we think about in the, this in the context of microbial evolution, you've got parent bacterium, you've got speciation, and you would normally expect the genes that are contained within the genomes oops, to follow that track as well, right? So this is vertical inheritance from parent to offspring. But in situations where we have recombination and lateral gene transfer, we buck that trend and we find that genetic material is shared across potentially very distant organisms within the tree. And so, you know, at one level we can talk about recombination between members of the same strain or members of the same species, right, which would be uh, conferred through certain mechanisms. But at the same time, if you look, and you don't have to look very hard, you can see evidence for gene transfer between members, different species of the same genus or different, uh, you know, families in the same order or even between different phyla, right? And so this is something that's really important from an evolutionary process, but it's also very important in a very practical sense. And the reason for this, and Finn mentioned anthropomorphizing, and I'm just gonna pick right up where he left off. Um, lateral gene transfer gives microorganisms the capacity to acquire new functions from even distant related species. And so it's like, oh, look, you have a really cool gene that confers some resistance phenotype or some metabolic capability or makes you not dead at 60 degrees Celsius, 
I want that. There's your anthropomorphizing. And so it creates this capacity to share genes. And this is really, really interesting and important ecologically, just from that sort of microbiome perspective. But it's also really important as we try to understand the evolution and the spread of things like antimicrobial resistance. All right, so here's just an example. Uh, we looked at this a couple of years ago as part of a gene order clustering uh, approach that we developed. And so what you're looking at here is a little tiny piece of four different bacterial genomes, actually from four different genera. And what we've done, and this is actually uh, card predictions. So the blue genes are not card predictions. They're just kind of flanking fun stuff. At the top, you see five genes in close proximity to each other that are all colored green. What does it mean to be colored green? It means that the resistance gene identifiers looked at these genes and said, I've seen this before. This is a perfect match. And again, I think uh, Andrew talked about this during his uh, section. So that's E. coli. But then we can look at other members of family Enterobacteriaceae, right? So Salmonella, Citrobacter, Klebsiella, Enterobacter. And when we look, we see the same genes in pretty much the same order. Notice that in the bottom three cases, they're yellow and orange, and that's strict and loose. But these are still really, really similar to each other, far more similar to each other than they would be had they been inherited vertically from some common ancestor of this group I don't know, 300 million years ago. Or whatever, right? So this is a product of lateral gene transfer. These resistance genes have been transmitted between different enteric bacteria through some sort of process. And so Yersinia pestis is a, um, a bacterium that's the causative agent of things like bubonic plague. And there have been some very striking examples recently of, of transfers that have happened fairly recently, right? And so the main chromosome of Yersinia pestis is about 4.6 million base pairs. And then there was a study published a few years ago that was looking at isolates collected from Madagascar, and they identified a couple of plasmids. And that's interesting. There's been acquisition of genetic material from somewhere else. You can see there, one is 171,000 base pairs, the other is 47,000 base pairs, roughly. And so that's interesting, but it's also a big problem because these plasmids both carry different sets of resistance genes. So the one on the left has doxy resistance genes and the one on the right has streptomycin resistance genes. Possibly even more scary is the fact that these are both examples of inter-order transfer or on the right, inter-class transfer because Yersinia pestis is a gamma proteobacterium and Acidivorax is a beta proteobacterium. So these are transmissions across long evolutionary distances. And so mobile genetic elements are crucial agents of lateral gene transfer. They're not the only means to an end, but they are by far the principal means to the end of lateral gene transfer. And so these are DNA sequences that can move within and between genomes. And they have kind of a story behind, them, right? So they're born. They can combine, right? So these things are very fluid. They work together in some cases. Mobile genetic element A can't do something. Right? It can't move to a different cell. It can't integrate into the chromosome. Then mobile genetic element B is like, oh, I can help. I have encode some proteins that can work in trans. They can compete. And somebody mentioned incompatibility plasmids a few days ago. And so you can have, you know, sort of competitive interactions between plasmids with phages and so on. And they wither and die. And so if you look across a set of bacterial genomes, if you're looking at a particular mobile genetic element, whatever it is, an integrative conjugative element, you might find cases where your sort of platonic ideal MGE is present in this genome and this genome and this genome. But if you look more closely, you might see that the, that genome, that genome, and that genome, other genomes, have these sort of relics where some of the genes have been lost and others are falling apart due to rapid mutations. So it no longer functions as a mobile genetic element. 
And one of the main reasons we care about them, apart from the fact that lateral gene transfer is really interesting and fun, is the fact that they can bring different types of so-called cargo with them. And so the example I've shown you already is antimicrobial resistance genes, but there's all sorts of other stuff they can carry. They can carry virulence factors. They can carry metabolic pathways on them. And, you know, this is not something that's just limited to pathogenic organisms. There's all sorts of absurd things that go on across the tree of life, which I don't have time to get into, but are super fun. If you take a cell, and if you can identify all of the mobile genetic elements it contains, then that collective total is referred to as the mobilome. And so if we're trying to understand an organism, or a specific isolate in its genome, understanding the risks posed by that organism is intertwined with understanding what is contained within its mobilome, right? So you probably heard about the resistome this week. Well, now we're talking about the mobilome. And so just a few examples, and I think many of you are very familiar, and I'm sure actually many of you are way more familiar with specific plasmids and are potentially the world experts on those plasmids, but I'm just going to give a very high-level overview of several different types of mobile genetic elements, kind of not exactly pretending that they're entirely different from each other, but let's just keep in mind that these things can combine with each other and produce these sort of monstrous, um, you know, Frankenstein type elements that can do all sorts of things. So we'll start with plasmids. Plasmids are typically small, whatever that means, independent, circular, or occasionally linear DNA molecules. What does independent means? It generally means that they are separate from the main bacterial chromosome or chromosomes. Prokaryotes can host multiple plasmids in multiple copy numbers. And so you have some plasmids that are relatively large, a few hundred thousand nucleotides. Those are typically present in the same frequency, the same count as, let's say, the main chromosome. So if you sequence a cell at a given time, you'll probably be sequencing like, you know, a single copy plasmid if that plasmid is large. But there are other cases where you have plasmids that can be present dozens or even hundreds of times in a single cell. So there's all sorts of implications to that, both in terms of function, transmissibility, and detection. Plasmids can be sort of grouped into a few different mobility classes. And so at the pinnacle of independence, and self-sufficiency are the conjugator plasmids, which would encode everything they need to transmit from cell A to cell B. Right? So that includes the, um, the relaxase to start the process, replicase, includes all the stuff they need to construct the pillus that connects two cells. Mobilizable is still able to move, but it depends on some factors being contributed by other things in the cell. And then we also have non-mobilizable plasmids. And these kind of recently literature suggests are actually about half of plasmids, um, which is a bit surprising because I've always thought of plasmids as being able to trigger their own transmission, but actually half or more of all known plasmids are non-mobilizable. And so they depend on vertical inheritance or other processes like transformation to survive. So I've got a couple of images there at the bottom just to give you a feel for a couple of useful pieces of information about plasmids. On the left is a summary of a whole bunch of reference plasmids and their size distribution. And so it's a log scale. You can see that it's kilobases from 100 nucleotides all the way up to over um, a hundred thousand, right? Or actually a million nucleotides. And so there are some plasmids, they're really small, they're really cute, they don't do much apart from propagate themselves that are less than a kilobase in size. But then there are others that are very large to the point where you're kind of like, why are you calling this a plasmid now? And you've got a taxonomic breakdown there, but you can kind of see that the distribution really favors kind of, in some cases, excuse me, uh, six to eight kilo, um, kilobases 
And then we get a lot sort of 50 to 100 kV as well. Now, one useful piece of information as well is what I'm showing you on the right, which is that, and I suspect the idea of uh, GC content has come up, right? Different um, organisms tend to have different proportions of G plus C in their genomes. There's quite a bit of variation there from like 15% all the way up to 75%. But organisms typically have characteristic GC content on average. But if you look at the GC content of a given chromosome in a cell, and if you look at the GC content of a plasmid or two plasmids or whatever plasmid it carries, you often see differences in GC content between the two. And so this reflects a couple of things, and it's also useful to us. It reflects a couple of things, one being that that plasmid may have recently been acquired from some other organism, which had a GC content that's more similar to that of the plasmid. But suddenly you find yourself in E. coli and you're 10% different because you're recently acquired. So we can see that. The other is that plasmids tend to have fairly, in many cases, idiosyncratic genes, right? So they have a lot of insertion sequences and things like that that tend to push them in certain directions in terms of GC content. Okay, so plasmids generally, I shouldn't generalize too much, but they're often unwelcome. The cells in general don't like acquiring foreign DNA. And that kind of makes sense in a way because a lot of the stuff that you might take up stands a pretty good chance of killing you. And so there's a couple of strategies that plasmids need to consider, again, anthropomorphizing, in order to be able to survive and propagate. One is that they need to have the capacity to copy, right? So they need their own origin of replication with associated replication genes. Okay. Again, there's that copy number issue I mentioned. They need to be able to partition themselves and cell division. And then in terms of, so that's kind of propagating yourself, the ability to make copies of yourself. The other aspect is how do you both make yourself useful to the host and also kind of be somewhat subtly threatening to the host? And what I mean by that is if you carry an antimicrobial resistance gene, then maybe you confer some kind of selective benefit if that antibiotic happens to be hanging around. On the other side of things, if the cell is trying to get rid of you, then there are a few different strategies you can use. And I'm not going to get to them in detail for time reasons, but the toxin antitoxin system, very, very short, in very, very short, is if you get rid of me, my toxin will kill you. So don't get rid of me. Uh, plasmids can also defend themselves against uh, cellular defense systems like restriction enzymes. So they have often anti-restriction proteins. Transposons are generally a little bit less ambitious. They are very good at hopping from one place to another in the cell, so they can move between chromosome and plasmid or chromosome in different parts of the chromosome. Um, and the key aspect of transposons is they encode the transposase, which is what catalyzes their excision and insertion into a different part of the genome. There are a lot of these. Like if you look at mobile genetic elements, you will tend to see a lot of transposons. You will also see insertion sequences, which are the sequences which are like the simplified versions of transposons. I'm also, as I go along in a few cases, indicating one of, in most cases, a multitude of tools that you can use to try and detect these things given a genome sequence. Okay, one of my favorites, um, we've been staring at this one a lot lately, uh, integrative conjugative elements. So plasmids can conjugate. In this case, integrative conjugative elements or ice elements can actually both conjugate and insert themselves into the main chromosome. So that gives them a couple of strategies, right? One is to live like a plasmid and do sort of normal plasmidy things conjugate. The other is to drop itself in the bacterial chromosome 
and get all of the kind of ancillary benefits that come across come along with being part of the main chromosome, right? You just get replicated when the chromosome replicates. So you're just kind of hanging around. So they have that capacity, except when they lose their conjugation genes. Then they're called integrative mobilizable elements. Right? So they can still pop into the chromosome, they can still circularize, but they cannot independently transmit themselves through conjugation. They might be able to do it if there are other plasmids in the cell that encode the requisite pieces of the puzzle to conjugate, but they themselves cannot do it if they're IMEs. If they lose their recombination genes as well, and that's on the right there, you see the XIS and the INT, those recombination genes, which are the integrase that brings it into the chromosome and the excisionase that cuts it out. If they lose those, then they're kind of stuck in the chromosome. And maybe that's not the worst thing, but it does mean that to shift over to that sort of plasmid lifestyle, they again need help from other things in the cell to be able to excise themselves. Integrons are super, super interesting. Uh, these are arrays of genes, and we've seen arrays of like dozens of genes. They're integrated at attachment sites downstream of this uh, INTI protein. So basically the INTI protein is able to capture genetic information and insert it into this array. And so growing it over time by inserting at these attachment sites. And so you see these in a clinical context, you see them in environmental contexts, all sorts of metal resistance and other environmental adaptation genes are often found in integrons. There's one method there, acid, that you can use to predict them. Prophage, I'm sure you're all familiar, you know and love. Um, the lytic lifestyle is I invade, I replicate, I destroy. The lysogenic phases have that sort of intermediate step where they invade, they integrate, uh, they replicate with the genome. And then when times get hard, they excise and they destroy thanks for nothing. Right? And so we can obviously detect phages when they are inserted into the chromosome right? or indeed a plasmid. These also carry cargo genes a lot of the time, prophage encoded toxins, cell surface, um, or other types of resistance. Genomic islands. And so this is where. I mean, you're kind of looking at a literal Venn diagram here because a genomic island is simply a cluster of genes in, let's say, the chromosome that show evidence of lateral transmission. And so how is that differentiated from other stuff that is integratable into the chromosome? Well, it isn't. Right? So a genomic island can be an integrated prophage. It can be an integron. It can be an integrated ice element or anything else, and you see that on the right. So any of those can be a genomic island, and these are obviously very interesting and important parts of the genome because these will often carry genes of considerable interest, and they offer the opportunity in many cases to transmit those genes from the isolate you're looking at to other organisms. And so, and this was a debate that went on for many, many years, but if you think about a set of organisms evolving over time, right, you've got the Ur ancestor of um, Enterobacteriaceae, and there's a differentiation into different genera, genera into species, and so on. As this happens, there's this huge churn of lateral gene transfer going on certainly especially within closely related, uh, closely related populations of organisms, but also crossing these species and genus level divides. And so if you think about a tree of bacterial life, let's say, that tree is actually going to have a lot of alternative connections that reflect these other relationships that are created through lateral gene transfer. So maybe this is the tree of cells, right? You've got a nice, beautiful, bifurcating, branching tree, but then when you overlay the history of various genes on top of it, it's going to look a lot messier. To the point 
where it can actually have significant impacts on your ability to infer the history of those organisms at all. Because if you're using genetic sequence data as the basis for inferring your evolutionary history, and a lot of that genetic data is telling completely divergent stories, what do you end up with? Well, maybe you get an average trend that corresponds to the truth, the correct answer, but maybe you get something that's completely different. We've shown this with various studies and you know, what happens if you turn up the rate of lateral gene transfer or if you bias gene transfer between specific lineages. What comes out from a genome phylogeny method can be very different from what went in in terms of the true tree. Okay, so that was part one, the overview of mobile genetic elements at a thousand miles an hour. So now let's think about the key types of evidence we might want to consider if we're trying to identify mobile genetic elements. And so first thing to keep in mind is that it's actually really hard. In some cases, it's really easy, but in total, if you're trying to tell the whole lateral gene transfer recombination, mobile genetic element story of a given genome or set of genomes, it's both important and really hard, as is everything else in bioinformatics. And so it's important because if we can detect these genes, we can identify major modes and vectors of transmission, answering questions like which genes are being shared? What is the mechanism, right? Is it a plasmid? Is it a conjugate transduction? Whatever. Who is sharing with whom? Which species of, you know, which strains of E. coli are sharing with which isolates of salmonella, whatever. And a corollary to that is where is the sharing happening, right? And think about one health in the context of things moving between different habitats, the farm, the abattoir, uh, you know, the packaged meat, then given all sorts of conditions, environmental conditions, application of antibiotics, microbial community structure, other controlling factors, those will have a huge influence on where that sharing is taking place. Given the right data and the right contextual data, we can start to try and unwind and untangle these things, but it's really difficult. If we do have this information, then we can identify risk factors and say, well, there appears to be a lot of gene sharing going on here. Therefore, we should try and take measures to mitigate that. Where do we prioritize our efforts? Well, okay, who's sharing with whom and where? Focus on that. But it's hard. And so there's a few things that we can do. There's a few clues that we can try and grab onto using methods you've already seen this week to try and get as comprehensive as possible a picture of the story of Gene Sharon. And so one example of this is let's go back and think about that species tree again. So what I'm showing you here is kind of a tube, right? So the, the sort of outer edges of this correspond to organismal evolution. Right? So the story of this is the common ancestors down at the bottom, that's the root of the tree. There was a speciation event that gave us the ancestral lineage for A and B and the ancestral lineage for C and D. And then there were speciation events that gave us lineage A, lineage B, lineage C, lineage D. That's the true history of the organisms. I drew it so I know. But then within that, the bold face, the solid line there is the history of one gene. That's the evolutionary history. And so notice that for the most part, its evolution tracks that of the lineages that contain it. So it's just merrily going along, getting copied when the genome is copied and you know, getting partitioned into the daughter cells when that happens. But then very recently, as you as is indicated by the dash red arrow there, there's been a transmission event. And actually, the copy of this gene that's present in lineage B is suddenly transferred to lineage D. And so in this scenario, D's copy is overwritten and lost. It is replaced by B. 
What is the consequence of that? The consequence is that at that point, at the point of donation and reception, I was going to say recipiency, but that's not a word. At the point of reception, D and B have an identical copy of that gene. So they look identical. So if we take the set of genes, that gene in A and B and C and D, the tree is going to look like this. B and D are going to be similar to each other. And A and C are going to be separate. So this is a piece of evidence that we can draw on. And we've developed different methods to infer lateral gene transfer by saying, here's the species tree. Here's a gene tree. What are the differences that tell us about possible evidence of lateral gene transfer? I'm not going to walk you through this figure in detail, but the basic idea is that on the left-hand side, we have a tree that is the history of the organisms. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, the branching pattern gives you the organismal history, but that curved reticulate arrow shows you a donation event. On the right is the consequence to the gene tree. And so we have two different trees. We have our inferred species tree, don't ask me about the circularity of inferring species trees from genomes that have lateral gene transfer in them. That's a different discussion. Species tree on the left, gene tree on the right. Okay. We can compare these to identify impacts of lateral gene transfer. Here's another one. And I already mentioned this when we talked about plasmids, right? The stuff that moves around tends to have DNA composition that is different from the host organism. This is true of plasmids because plasmids bounce around. It's true of prophages. It's true of other mobile genetic elements because both of the genetic material they contain, the genes and so on, but also because they tend to hang out in other genomes. Right? And so over time, they tend to what's called ameliorate. They start to look more like the host genome, but then they move somewhere else and they look different again. Kind of related to that and, and even more related to the phylogenetic question is the idea of unexpected sequence similarity. And so in the phylogenetic example, the reason we got that weird gene tree is because of the similarity relationships. But this doesn't need to just happen in the context of uh, a tree inference, right? We don't just need to look at phylogenetic trees to try and get a handle on this. And so in some cases, we can look at a set of sequences and say, well, typically, this sequence and that sequence, this genome and that genome, are about 20% dissimilar, like mass distance, camers, whatever. So we can say that, but then we can look at specific regions of the genome and see that, oh, those regions are 2% different or 0.5% different. And the, dis the disparity between those regions and the general genome can be pretty persuasive evidence that that part was recently transferred between relatives of those two genomes. Another useful piece of evidence is if you see some sort of weird pattern and then you look at where that gene exhibiting that pattern is and it's on a mobile genetic element. Okay, well, isn't that interesting? So the position of the implicated genes can be very important, it can be very informative. But it's important to keep in mind that all of these methods, all of these clues can mislead us. Phylogenetic trees can lie, they frequently lie. DNA composition can be weird for all sorts of different reasons. And maybe these two regions are really similar not because of recent lateral gene transfer, but just because they're repeat rich or there's been some sort of convergence. So we need to be really careful about this stuff. But when we start to look, we might start to see interesting things emerge. So maybe we look at a single gene and it shows a weird pattern. Like, well, okay, it's phylogenetic evidence. It's supported by a tree with a reasonably large bootstrap or Bayesian posterior value. Okay, so that's, that's interesting but we don't necessarily trust it. But if we look at this at genome scale, then we can start to look 
and see if multiple genes are showing similar weird patterns. If we start to see the same pattern repeating again and again and again, then we start to think, well, okay, once could be happenstance, twice could be coincidence, but 15 times, well, maybe there's something more going on there. And if those multiple genes happen to be next to each other or close to next to each other, then maybe it's still artifactual, but it starts to push us even more in that direction of believing that there's something really interesting going on here. Okay. So if you remember at the beginning, I mentioned despair. So this is where I try and induce a little bit of despair. So these are all ice elements. Um, isolated from different genomes, and they're similar and they're not similar, right? You can see they contain some core genes, but they also, you know, some have large sets of accessory genes, and there's sort of a weird kind of honeycomb network of similarity here. Right? Obviously, the ones with the orange sets of genes are, are quite similar to each other, although they still have differences. But if you keep looking, you see that there's all sorts of relative degrees of similarity going on here. So that's ice elements. This is integrated conjugative elements. So um, similar to the ones that I've shown you, Streptococcus pneumoniae, pneumonia, Streptococcus crispatus, um, C. diff, Klebsiella. So this is all over the place, gram positives, gram negatives. And again, you can see that there are certain things that are shared and others that are not. Notice, too, that all of the, it's, it's a bit pixelated. I apologize if it's not clear, but these things all have different names. TN6087, TN6002, 6003, 1545. So these things have different names. And so if you're trying to classify these, then they're going to be put in separate bins. And so there's an important underlying question here, which is, at what point are things the same or different? Ooh. Okay, that was strange. Sorry, things have gone weird. Okay, and this is just the last example. It's plasmids, Listeria monocytogenes. And again, I'm just looking at different classifications of plasmids, again, different names, but then some groupings and degrees of similarity. And so if we're trying to detect something and if we're trying to classify something, it can be really difficult to try and sort through this. But we try anyway. And so for part three, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples that are mostly relevant to what we're going to do in the tutorial section about methods that try and grab onto these clues in various different ways. And it's true in general in bioinformatics that if you have a problem, multiple sequence alignment, or let's build a phylogenetic tree, or let's do homology search, there's usually several dozen solutions, many of which will be available, some of which will download a, a sub smaller subset of which will compile and run. And so, you can compare those both conceptually and in practice, right? You can validate them. You can compare their predictions. So just like identifying evolutionary patterns is different, predicting mobile genetic elements can be very difficult, and it could not be otherwise. And some of these clues are very similar to what I just showed you in terms of lateral gene transfer, right? So the mobile genetic elements can look foreign relative to the rest of the genome. You can look for specific genes that are often characteristic of MGEs, right? So plasmids have replicases. You can look for transposases, integrases, excisionases. Um, you know, you can find virulence factors in AMR genes anywhere, but finding them in some concentration next to some of those first things I showed you might increase your belief, your confidence that a given region of a genome is in fact a mobile genetic element. You've got secretion system genes. You've got ways of transmitting yourself, right? So 
these can all be important clues. Searching against reference databases, right? So there's lots of reference mobile genetic element databases out there. NCBI has a high quality plasmid reference. If you're interested in ICE, there's the Iceberg 2 database. So this sort of parallels, if you think about reference AMR gene databases like CARD, right? You have things that you can compare against. Um, I dare say CARD has the best organizational principles of all these things, but the other ones have information that is useful as well. You can also do gene by gene homology search, and you can also just do heuristic distance calculations using things like MASH. And so I don't need to talk about this at all, the resistance gene identifier, right? Search versus a manually created database. This is going to come up in the tutorial section, but I just had it as here in here for that reason. What about plasmids? Well, think about the types of clues we might want to look for when we're examining plasmids. So MobSuite is this tool that was developed by um, James Robertson, Kirill Bezos, and um, Bezanov, and John Nash, among others, at uh, P. Hackenwell. And the goal here is to take either complete genomes or draft genomes that contain a bunch of contigs and say, these ones are plasmid associated. And furthermore, they are these kind of plasmids. That's the goal. And so central to the idea of MobSuite is to have a reference database of plasmids. So you've got a high quality database from NCBI and they cluster it. And if you're familiar with concepts in microbial ecology, like operational taxonomic units, OTUs, right, where you're clustering things based on similarity, it's the same idea here. You've got a clustered reference database where this set might comprise a handful of reference plasmids. And then you take your contigs from your complete genome or draft assemblies, and you throw them at mob suite. And it says, it asks basically two questions. One is, does this contig have some of these smoking gun genes, replicon, relaxases, repetitive elements that we often find in plasmids? Does it have those? If so how similar are they? And what are they characteristic of? And the other is, does this contig share some substantial amount of similarity above some threshold that's assigned to plasmids in that clustered reference database? So by putting that type of information together, we can start to get a read on whether we think specific contigs are, in fact, derived from plasmids. And so MobSuite is MobSuite because it comprises a set of different software tools. One is mob cluster. Now we're not going to run mob cluster because mob cluster, its goal is to take a set of plasmids and build that reference. We're just going to be using the reference that ships with mob suite because building a new one requires other high quality plasmids. And we've always just used the references that um, the mob suite developers have provided. Mob recon. Find and classify plasmids in my data set. Is it a circle? Yes, then we'll call it a plasmid. Do we find some of these probable genes, relaxases, for example? Well, we did find them. Okay, this contig is a candidate plasmid. And then compare against this reference database. Oh, look, the nucleotide composition is quite similar. All right, well, that's a candidate um, plasmid contig as well. The last part of this is mob typer, which looks at relaxase information and other types of evidence to do a few things. One is to predict whether a given contig or the plasma that it's thought to be associated with is likely to be conjugative, mobilizable, or non-mobilizable. And another, which we're going to look at in the tutorial section, is what is the predicted host range? Is it a narrow host range plasmid? Does it appear to be capable of transmitting itself across ridiculous evolutionary distances? And so that's the goal of mob typer. And one thing is if you run mob recon to do these assignments, 
then you will also get the outputs that are produced by mob typer. So mob typer runs in any case. Another tool that's been developed for the detection of genomic islands is, well, I've called it island asterisk there. This is out of Fiona Brinkman's group. And over the last, I don't know, many years, uh, her group has been developing all sorts of different tools that try and grab on to different pieces of evidence to say, yeah, I think this is a genomic island. And so island path is a really crucial piece of this because it looks for that smoking gun of nucleotide composition as well as using the PFAM database to identify candidate mobility genes. So it's both about the composition of a region in general, as well as the specific genes it contains. Um, Island Viewer is an integrated viewer that allows you to explore predicted genomic islands, look at virulence predictions, look at predicted AMR genes. Island Compare brings this all together with an additional uh, property that is extremely useful because you can predict stuff in a given genome, right? You can predict the presence of this thing or that thing, this mobile genetic element, whatever. But in many cases, what you really want to do is be able to look at the distribution of a specific mobile genetic element across a set of genomes. And to do that, you need the ability to say, this predicted island from this genome corresponds to, is homologous with, is similar enough to this other one that I'm going to call them the same thing. And so Island Compare does this. It runs a set of predictive tools, and then it does this clustering across the set of predictions to say, oh, here's a really similar group. We're going to connect them, do some clustering, and see whether this is a group that kind of survives and we think is homologous across different sets of genomes. And so the visualization I'm showing you here, which is very similar to the one you're going to be looking at later, is a visualization of this. On the left, we have a phylogenetic tree. Each leaf of the tree corresponds to a different genome. The track to the right of that leaf is a representation of that genome, and every colored thingamajig you see is a different genomic island predicted or similar to something that's known, a curated island. And where you see rectangular thingies of the same color, those are predicted to be the same genomic island in different genomes. Right? And so even just look at the far left there, we have three little blue squares in the from the top, first, second, and last genomes, and those are predicted to be homologous. Island Compare is saying those are pretty much the same island, so we can think of them as being the same thing to an extent. We can think about prophage prediction, right? So we can think about prediction of ice elements and everything else, but prophages, um, this is in here because we were doing a lot of comparisons of methods um, a couple of years ago and just thinking a lot about it, so this was kind of at the forefront of our minds. And this is, so this method works quite well, but there's sort of an interesting question to ask at some point, especially in this age of machine learning and big data and AI, which is at what point are you trying too hard? And the reason I say this in the context of Vibrant is because it does a lot of very clever things. It looks for evidence, a given region of the genome, that all sorts of different um, prophage or uh, bacteriophage-associated genes are present. It has all sorts of filters. That's the workflow you see on the right. Okay, so we have our input. We do all sorts of predictive stuff. Comparison against several different reference databases. You keep going, you keep going. It generates 27 different attributes for each sequence that's given to it. And then those attributes are fed into a neural network to generate predictions. And so Vibrant works really well 
it, it, it's, it's effective. It gives quite high accuracy, but at the cost of some level of interpretability, right? Because as soon as you start to feed things into an artificial neural network, you're combining things in sort of strange Byzantine ways that can make it difficult to understand what's influencing the predictions. But maybe that doesn't, maybe you care mainly about the prediction and that's fine. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention for this slide is the thing at the bottom there, which is that a group of authors actually developed not necessarily a new method, but, and this is really, really, really valuable, a comparison framework for different uh, prophage prediction tools. So reference databases, evaluation frameworks, because if you're trying to decide which of the following 10 methods to use to predict something, maybe there are papers out there already that have compared their performance on certain data sets that may not be your data sets. But anyway, these sorts of rigorous, robust comparison frameworks allow you to test your new method against a bunch of existing methods. And that's really, really valuable. But we can make use of all of these clues. The thing is mobile genetic elements change. And they mutate, of course, everything mutates, but by their very nature, they are very plastic. You can get plasmids that fuse. You can get all sorts of transposition. You can get big gene order changes. And you'll see some examples of that when we start poking through the really nice visualizations in Island Compare, it's part two of the tutorial. And so very rapidly, things can diverge. And at some point, again, you're like, is this the same thing or not? Can I even detect it? If I train my method on the previous MGEs, is this thing new enough that I'm going to miss it? Another really important thing to keep in mind is that Databases are far, far better for some organisms than others. And I'm, I'm someone who works a lot with pathogenic organisms, but I really, really love hyperthermophiles because they're so evolutionarily interesting. But guess what? Plasma databases for hyperthermophiles are so well developed. Now, that's an extreme case, but even amongst different pathogenic groups, you will find better characterization of these kinds of things in some groups than others. Right? So gram-negative enterics are a great example of this. You know, Salmonella, E. coli, and their closest relatives have been studied a lot. And so the references for those are going to be a lot stronger than they are for some gram-positives, for example. So this is just something really important to keep in mind. If you are running tools on your genomes, at least understand if there's a disconnect between the organisms that the developers were thinking of or the databases that people were thinking of and the organisms you care about the most. Another thing to keep in mind is that short read assembly tends to fail spectacularly for some mobile genetic elements. Okay. And this is particularly true. We have a paper uh, of Thinletted a couple of years ago on the identification of plasmids, in this case from metagenomic data, and their methods to try and do this. And it would be an exaggeration to say that it's not possible, but doing it well with short read data, you know, it's hard enough for isolate genomes because. Plasmids are full of things that confound assembly algorithms. Look, repeats. I love dealing with repeats. I give up. So it's important to keep this in mind as well and be, be cognizant of the risk of false negatives, for example. Maybe your plasmid of interest that you are curious to know whether it's there or not is actually just in the shrapnel of unassembled reads. So just be careful. I haven't talked about this at all, but 
if you can think about defined starting points and ending points of things like genomic islands, right? Because it's like, here's the genomic island, and then here's the stuff that's not the genomic island. Where's the boundary? Implicitly, maybe that's the point of recombination, right? for example. That can actually be really hard to identify as well. And so maybe you don't care about that. Maybe you're just happy to say that it's genomic island X worried about which specific set of nucleotides represent the point of acquisition and recombination. But if you do, then this is a very challenging problem. Okay, bringing it home. So like I said, the last part is a bit of shameless self-promotion, but there is also a legitimate motivation here. And that is that uh, what I'm about to tell you about feeds a little bit into the tutorial. We're not gonna run out of tea, but some of the results that you'll be working with were generated using it. So I just thought I'd introduce it briefly. So the ADAT pipeline was developed to streamline a lot of genomic analysis, particularly in the context of reticulate evolution, coevolution, lateral gene transfer. So trying to understand, you know, trying to do a good job annotating genomes, but also taking that information a couple of steps further and saying, what are the evolutionary dynamics of this set of organisms? Is there a lot of lateral gene transfer? Do we think there are mobile genetic elements? Is there a lot of lateral gene transfer of the genes that we think are on those mobile genetic elements? So this is the goal of the ADAT pipeline. And so this is just the little London tube map and a couple of critical things. So ADAT is implemented using NextFlow. It brings together a lot of widely used tools for predictions. Um, so you can see uh, assembly tools there. Uh, we have various predictive tools. We have island path. We don't have island compare yet, although we really, really want to. RGI, Bacter, Proca for uh, you know, gene prediction. Anarur, P. pangolin for pangenome identification. Phylogenomics. And then we have stuff like RSPR at the end, which is that phylogenetic comparison method I, I mentioned to try and identify evidence of lateral gene transfer by comparing the reference tree from each gene tree in turn. And there's a whole bu a bunch of other stuff in here that I'm not going to talk about. I'm just going to focus on the, um, the stuff that's relevant to the tutorial, mostly. OK, so the goal here is, first of all, to be scalable. So. One thing, again, this is not just bioinformatics, but it's certainly true of bioinformatics, is that there's two ways to do it. One is slow and accurate, and the other is fast and heuristic. It's huge oversimplification, but the idea is that if you have 50 genomes you want to look at, you have more analysis options than you do if you have a 5,000 genome data set. And so we have alternatives here that are really meant to handle that effectively and say, well, Okay, I've got a set of 100 genomes. I'm going to use Panaru to infer the pan genome. I've got 5,000. I'm not going to use Panaru because the scaling is not fantastic. Let's use Ppangolin instead. You can also choose which tools to include or exclude. Right? There's annotations, right? So again, antimicrobial resistance genes, different mobile genetic elements, genomic islands, and so on. Then we've got the phylogynamics, right? So this is where we infer pangenomes and we build all the trees of all the genes. And the dynamics part are things like RSPR for phylogenetic inference of lateral gene transfer. We have a tool called Evil CCM, which looks at the patterns of different features. So the presence and absence pattern, the profile of this genomic island and this AMR gene across a set of genomes and says, are they similar? Do they tend to be found in the same genomes and absent from the same genomes? And it puts a test statistic and p-value on top of that. We also have, we incorporate tools for recombination inference like Gubbins and Vertical. So here's just an example. Um, this is annotations. So we have a data set that we've been developing on. We like to call 20 times five because it's 20 genomes of E. coli, 20 of Salmonella, 20 Citrobacter, 20 Enterobacter, 20 Klebsiella. And so we take these and we push them through ADAT and we say, dear ADAT, 
what sorts of mobile genetic elements do you find? And what you see here is just a mapping of the distribution of mobile genetic elements across these genera. If you're not familiar with an upset plot, this is basically a better way of doing a multi-dimensional Venn diagram. I mean, if you've seen the banana-shaped Venn diagram, you know that scientific perfection has been achieved. But in this case, you get a nice visualization of the distribution of these things. And so the five points on the left, you see Escherichia, black dot, Citrobacter, black dot. Each of these represents mobile genetic elements that are found in a single genus. So notice that Escherichia has 262 mobile genetic elements in total that are not found in any other genus. It's restricted to Escherichia. As you go to the right, you see different combinations of genera. So 82 mobile genetic elements are found exclusively in Citrobacter and Escherichia. Most of those are virulence factors from VFDB. At the far right, you can see the total set of elements that are present at least once in all genera, right? And that's the largest number, 328. So there are many AMR genes, many BACMET is metal resistance, right? So many metal resistance genes, many predicted ice elements, many predicted plasmids, and many predicted virulence factors that are found across all five genera in our Enterobacteriaceae data set. Uh, this, I think I have to give the very, very short version. Basically, this is a plot where we take every single gene tree we've inferred and say, how big is it? And how messed up is it? So how big is it is the x-axis? How messed up is it relative to the reference tree is the y-axis? So this is basically how much lateral gene transfer has there been? And long story short, the genes that have the highest amount of lateral gene transfer relative to the size of the tree is the stuff on the left. Prophage, transposase, um, conjugative transfer system. So that's the top. It's not too surprising. But as we start to look further down the list, right, there's like 40,000 things in this list, we can start to find interesting things that maybe tell us something really important about what's being transferred. This is just looking at evolutionary associations. So this is comparing these presence and absence patterns and saying for all of our virulence factors and metal resistance factors and plasmids and AMR genes, which ones show common patterns of presence and absence across genomes? Furthermore, which ones show interesting patterns of presence and absence relative to the tree? Because if everything is found in E. coli, if, if, if this thing is found in E. coli and that thing is found in E. coli, surprise, right? That's not exactly unexpected. But if you have something that's found in these two specific E. coli, and this one specific citrobacter and these three specific enterobacter, that's feature one. And feature two has the same distribution. That's surprising and weird. And the similarity between those two is really interesting. So our evil CCM algorithm tries to pin that down. The graph on the right is simply saying that one predicted mob sweep plasmid AA739 has strong associations with a couple of AMR genes and associations with a number of different virulence factors. So this is something that we can investigate further based on the literature, based on looking at the plasmid and seeing whether it does seem to contain these genes, for example. And this is actually looking at these phylogenetic profiles, the presence absence patterns, right? So we've got our reference tree on the left, the coloring you see right after that is just the different genera. And then each column is a different feature. It might be a predicted ice element, or it might be a predicted AMR gene, or what have you. And the red bars just indicate where things are present. And the absence of a red bar indicates something is absent. And so you can see right away that there are some features here that have really weird distributions, right? So quacky delta one and sol one, right? are present at least once in all five genera, but there's no genus in which they are ubiquitous. And the reason for that is because they've transferred a lot. And so stuff like this allows us to start to ask questions about who tends to be transferred together and what are the elements that tend to mediate this transfer. Okay, that's it. Wow, three o'clock. I guess that would be on time if I'd started at two. But that's it. Thank you very much. And do we have the photo session now or is that after the lab?
Um, that is after the lab. So we're going to move to our short break now. Okay, perfect. Thank you all. And I will dive into the ID.